Tonight on The Rundown, arrests made in the shooting that killed a two-year-old boy. But we're learning about the suspects and the outrage from police over the tragedy. Plus, a big step toward the monumental move. Virginia lawmakers approve a bill to build the Wizards and the Caps Arena in Alexandria. The next steps needed to make the move a reality. And Super Bowl kickoff is in just two days. What do you have, or rather, who do you have winning it all? Our J.P. Finley spoke with experts who know the game best and might help you decide. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Leon Harris on this Friday, February 9th, 2024. And we're going to begin with the arrest made in the shooting that killed a two-year-old boy and injured his mother. Two men are facing charges tonight in connection to the death of Jeremy Pou Caceres. Israel Fuentes Jr. and Johnny Alejandro Tercios are under arrest. Police say the pair were in a car that had been stolen, got out of it, and shot at another group of people at an apartment complex in Langley Park. Sadly, Jeremy and his mom were caught in the crossfire. These are the cases we lose sleep over. These are the cases the county executive, the chief of police, myself, and every cop up here lose sleep over. Not just while we're working, but even after we retire. We'll never forget these cases because children are not supposed to die. Assistant Chief Hale also said there were two more people inside that carjacked vehicle. Not clear, though, if they fired any shots. Our Darcy Spencer has the latest from the scene of the shooting. There is a tremendous sense of relief here in this community, knowing that two suspects have now been arrested in connection with the fatal shooting of this two year old boy. He was basically out here in this courtyard area yesterday afternoon, his mom pushing him in a stroller. And we learned during that news conference that they were both unintended targets. This is video of the two year old little boy who was shot and killed while being pushed in a stroller in Langley Park Thursday afternoon. These images shared by a former nanny who was distraught when she learned little Jeremy Powu Caceres had been killed in a senseless and violent attack. His mom was also shot but is expected to survive her injuries. It was quiet today at the apartment complex. Many said they were staying in, keeping their kids close. I heard uh, somebody sh was shooting. We thought it was like a fireworks, but uh, it was not. Cell phone video obtained by News 4 shows the chaotic scene in the courtyard of the complex crowded with people, including children. The little boy's mom was pushing him in the stroller when the shots were fired. You see in the video, police and medics rushing to the scene. They rendered aid and transported Jeremy to the hospital where he died. His mom getting the heartbreaking news as she was also being treated for a gunshot wound. Neighbors tell News 4 there is a lot of fear in the community. I never knew this was happening here. And the little boy, that's, that's very, very aching. That's very aching. It's inhuman. I have a small kid that's been shot. The shots were fired about 5.30 off Kanawa Street in this predominantly Hispanic community. Police had little information about the circumstances surrounding the shooting and whether it was random or targeted. Police officials were visibly angry over the loss of such a young child. That young baby did nothing to anyone and did not deserve to die because someone wants to come out here and play with guns. Bullets come down and they have real consequences. I can only pray that they weren't trying to kill a child, but I don't know at this point. Many residents we spoke to today expressed fear about crime and gang activity in the neighborhood. They want more security presence and more surveillance cameras. Police also told us at that news conference that this investigation is far from over, so we can expect possibly having additional arrests. It was also important to note that police did receive the help they were asking for from the community to identify these suspects, make this arrest for these both of these arrests within 24 hours. Back to you. Darcy Spencer reporting. Thank you, Darcy. Time now for the four things you need to know tonight. A Virginia man has died after he was assaulted one week ago today. It all went down outside of a Shoto restaurant on 15th Street in Northwest D.C. Police say they believe 41-year-old Vivek Kaneha got into an argument with the suspect before he was knocked to the ground and he hit his head on the concrete. Kaneha died last night at the hospital. He was the president and co-founder of Dynamo Technologies. 
If you have any information about the suspect you saw there in the video, you are asked to contact D.C. police. Hyattsville police are searching for a woman wanted for assaulting a pregnant woman. Surveillance cameras captured the incident on America Boulevard in late January. The video freezes here just before the attack, so you won't see it. Police say the suspect punched and kicked this pregnant woman who was walking up to the building's door. Paramedics treated the victim at the scene. Police did not say if the two people knew each other. Military officials identified the five U.S. Marines who were killed in a helicopter crash earlier this week. The Marines ranged in age from 21 to 28 years. All were assigned to Marine Heavy Helicopter Squadron 361 at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in San Diego. The crew was conducting some routine flight training when the helicopter went down. The cause of the crash is under investigation. Final preparations are underway in Las Vegas for Super Bowl 58. This is the first time ever in the Sin City hosting the big game. More than 100 million are expected to tune in and watch the Kansas City Chiefs take on the San Francisco 49ers on the tube. But a lucky 72,000 are expected to be there packed inside Allegiant Stadium. The most expensive ticket left to buy? Resellers asking for a whopping $45,000 on Ticketmaster for front row seats. And they will likely get it. Now to a major shakeup in the race to fill Maryland Senator Ben Cardin's soon to be vacant seat. Former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan announced that he is now running. Hogan says he made the decision to run for Senate, not to serve one party in his words, but quote, to try to be part of the solution. News 4's Derek Ward has the latest. The announcement comes as something of a shock, considering that Hogan had toyed with a third party presidential run and then declared that he would not run for the Senate. Now, the 67 year old former Maryland governor says he is indeed running for the Senate, quote, not to serve one party, but to stand up to both parties and fight for Maryland and fix the nation's broken politics. My fellow Marylanders, you know me. For eight years, we proved that the toxic politics that divide our nation need not divide our state. We overcame unprecedented challenges, cut taxes eight years in a row, balanced the budget, and created a record surplus. Political analyst Larry Sabato says Hogan adds intrigue to the race, and while Sabato believes he's a long shot to flip retiring Democrat Ben Cardin's seat, his presence in the Senate race is a godsend for Republicans, says Sabato. Win or lose. Because the Democrats are going to have to spend a fortune. They had planned to spend nothing in Maryland. Now they've got to take money away from seats that are really endangered, such as Ohio and Montana. Meanwhile, Democrat David Trone, running for that same Senate seat, released a statement calling Hogan's candidacy, quote, nothing but a desperate attempt to return Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump to power. Angela also Brooks, the former Prince George's County executive, who's another Democratic contender for that Senate seat, released a statement that says that she understands the challenges that Marylanders face. She has a record of getting things done and will put the people of Maryland first. And she says that's why, quote, I'm going to win this primary in May and beat Larry Hogan in November, end quote. Hogan, who's served as Maryland's governor from 2015 to 2023, is widely seen as a moderate Republican. He left the governor's office with a whopping 77 percent approval rating. And until December, he was a leader of the No Labels Group, which sought to provide an alternative to the leading presidential candidates. A big step for a monumental move this afternoon. Just hours ago, a Virginia House committee approved a bill to build and run the new Wizards and Caps Arena in Alexandria. It's a $2 billion project and the first time an arena has ever been financed this way. But as our IT reporter Ted Oberg found out, the debate was limited and the approval came quickly. Full debate on this huge bill in committee this afternoon was shorter than halftime at a Wizards game. This $2 billion deal, Virginia lawmakers on the House Finance Committee had no questions about it. There was no debate from committee members, and they allowed only five minutes of public comment for and another five minutes against. In Richmond these days, they are on a tight schedule. We admit that. Bills have to be passed out of the House by next Tuesday. It's four days from now. But lawmakers set their own schedule, and this bill came up for the first time today with many suggested changes. Under the plan, the state and the city of Alexandria will jointly fund the arena. It's about a billion and a half dollars in bonds paid back by the taxes raised in the arena district. If the teams leave early, they owe all that money anyway. That we knew. Today, they introduced changes in the group that will oversee the deal. The city of Alexandria is carrying half the debt and wanted half the power on that board. They still don't have it and pledged to keep pushing for that power. 
The deal now gives Monumental Sports both a seat on that board and $7 million in cash every year to run and maintain the arena. The bill now also calls for transportation improvements to be funded by taxes from the arena district if that money is available. The bill passed out of committee 17 to 3 after a hearing and just a few minutes of public comment. This could be a great new home for the Washington Wizards, the Washington Capitals, that working together we can create thousands of jobs, millions of dollars of revenue for the city and the Commonwealth, and of course, most importantly, many, many championships to come. This is a bad deal for every taxpayer in Virginia. We are saddling our children and grandchildren with 40 years of debt payments to help a billionaire get wealthier and wealthier. This bill should be renamed the Glenn Dome Billionaire's Bill. It's not a monumental opportunity for Virginia, but a monumental train wreck. A Virginia Senate committee was also supposed to consider the bill this afternoon. They canceled their meeting with little explanation at the last minute. One senator saying only there's still a lot of bills being worked. They'll meet again Monday. Under normal Senate rules, this all has to be done by Tuesday. Ted Oberg reporting. Thanks, Ted. Some sad news for fans of the popular La Cosecha Food Hall in Union Market. Two of the restaurants inside, Las Gemelas, Taqueria, and Destino, they've closed for good this past Sunday. The owner, Josh Phillips, tells our Telemundo 44, things haven't gotten any easier since they opened right around the start of the pandemic. Uh, part of it is the Union Market neighborhood. That's part of the problem, which uh, Phillips says is, was designed to have more office space, something that they thought would translate to more weekday foot traffic. Josh Phillips also says that inflation has taken quite a toll on both restaurants. He wasn't ready to go on camera to comment about this, but he did get, say this to us, quote, everything you've seen get expensive in the grocery stores has gotten expensive for us as well. We all put on a good face and make it look like we're killing it. But behind the scenes, we talked to a lot of restaurant owners. That is not the case. Now, he did not rule out potentially recreating Las Gemelas at some point somewhere else in D.C., but as of right now, there are no definitive plans. An early commuter alert for people who use Metro's Red Line. The agency says that multiple stations will shut down this summer so crews can work to connect the system to the new Purple Line. In early June, Metro is going to be closing five stations. Glenmont, Wheaton, Forest Glen, Silver Spring, and the Tacoma Station. The closures will last all summer long until around Labor Day, with the exception of the Tacoma Station. That one may open sooner, although an exact date for that has not been set. That's going to impact me a lot because I don't, I choose not to drive. I rely on metro, public transportation, Uber walking. I take the metro every day to work. Metro says the station closures are necessary to build a mezzanine to connect the purple line to the system. There will be shuttle buses available to bridge the gap in rail service, but commuters should expect it to take them a little bit longer to get around. The crime involving ex those expensive winter coats has reached such a level that D.C. police are sending out warnings on community lifts, list serves now. Police sent out this warning to Ward 8 residents, telling them about a concerning rise in thefts and robberies targeting these high-end coats like those made by Canada Goose and Montclair. The message tells people to stay vigilant and avoid confrontation. And they urge people to call 911 to report any incidents they're involved in. Tonight, the AFI Theater in Silver Spring will hold a celebration of the career of a groundbreaking film and TV producer and director. Topper Carew is best known for creating the hit TV series Martin and the cult movie classic DC Cab. But, you know, back in the 1980s, I'm sorry, 1960s, Carew was a student here at Howard University and the visionary behind one of the first youth art centers in the region. News 4's Mark Seagraves caught up with Carew at a new exhibit in his honor. Walking through the exhibit at the American University Museum today, Melvin. Topper Carew feels like he's come home. You know, I was born in Boston, but I feel like I grew up in D.C. The exhibit of photos and artifacts curated by students from D.C.'s Jackson Reed High School capture the excitement and energy that was the New Thing Art and Architecture Center at 18th Street and Florida Avenue in Adams Morgan. The New Thing served D.C. youth from 1966 to 1972. Carew, who studied architecture at Howard University, created the New Thing as a way to provide hope to the district's youth. I also wanted to uh, broaden the cultural tapestry 
and Washington, D.C. To, to, to let people know that jazz and blues and black art and, you know, and black literature was as important as anything else in the District of Columbia. So I was, I was, I was helping to paint another picture of D.C. The new thing gave young people the opportunity to learn from artists, academics, and musicians like Stevie Wonder, who performed a free concert for the new thing in 1967. He hit that stage and those kids loved him. Carew went on to a prolific career in film, television, and radio, but all of his work is influenced by his time here in D.C. I discovered my voice and the uh, intentionality of my work, which has been about you know, equity, justice, excellence. Today's interview was a full circle moment for both Carew and myself. As Carew noted, 54 years ago, while organizing a blues festival for the new thing, he was interviewed by my father, John Seagraves, for the Washington Star. This is a personal connection because your, your dad gave me a chance to voice what I believe to a lot of people. And now here I am talking to you, his son, and being interviewed. And that's thrilling because you, you, you love to connect with your past, you know? And thank you to, to your dad for putting those words, you know, that will ever, forever be, forever be. In the district, completing the circle, Mark Seagraves, News 4. All right, how cool is that connection? Carew's creativity has now taken him out of this world, literally. His latest project is a recording of school children singing This Little Light of Mine. It's being broadcast from the International Space Station. The exhibit honoring Carew at the American University Museum runs through March 17th, so go check it out. Still to come on The Rundown, we're talking all things Super Bowl, from the excitement for the fans to the action on the field. And get your predictions ready, because we're talking with some of the people who know the game best. And we're getting, we're getting their takes on what's going to go down on Sunday when we come back. A live look at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas tonight. We're just two days away from Super Bowl 58, a matchup between the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. That is the center of the sports universe right now. And as we count down to Sunday, thousands of fans are there in Vegas as the preparations and the parties kick into high gear. And that includes NBC's Jay Gray, who is inside the NFL experience with more on the Super Bowl hype. Good evening and welcome to the NFL experience. It is a massive football fun house, interactive games, so much memorabilia and so much to see. We're going to take you in the locker room right now. And to do that, you've got to go through the video tunnel clips from some of the greatest games, some of the greatest players over the years. It's amazing to see. And now you walk into what is the locker room, all set up like an NFL locker room. And you can see everything in place here. Look, you, you've got Dak Prescott, not at, at the game this weekend. You've got Saquon Barkley, again, not at the game this weekend. You've got Jalen Hurts, but it's all set up like you would see in their locker rooms if you went inside. And this just part of what you can experience here. What a good time for so many people, hundreds of thousands who will come through this during Super Bowl week. Just one of the parties, one of the events going on in Las Vegas, hosting the big game for the first time. And it seems like it's a city built for this. That's the latest from here in Las Vegas. I'm Jay Gray. Now back to you. All right, thanks, Jay. One of these days we want to see a Terry McLaurin jersey in the Super Bowl on the field. Now, uh, looking to Sunday, will Patrick Mahomes continue to grow his legacy? Or will Brock Purdy, the guy who was picked last in the 2022 draft, Mr. Irrelevant, will he help lead the 49ers to a Super Bowl win? Our J.P. Finley chatted with some of those guys out there who know the game best, and uh, he got their picks for the big game. People have been talking about this game for two weeks. Patrick Mahomes, Brock Purdy, Trent Williams, Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift. All of it, it's finally here. The Super Bowl's here. And what does everybody in America have an opinion on who's going to win the Super Bowl? So we talked to a whole bunch of people in Las Vegas to get their predictions. I'm going with the Niners, right? I do think they have the more talented football team. I'm scared as hell. I wouldn't bet money on it. When you look at these two quarterbacks, you know, Birdie playing 
lights out. You know, I, I hear people say he's a he's a game changer. He's a quarterback, man, because he makes some plays that a lot of people can't play, make. And Patrick Mahomes, you never count him out. You know, he have fun playing this game. It's like a, a guy with a Tucker truck out in the yard hauling dirt. That's the way he plays football. 27-24, Kansas City. With authority, you're saying. <laughs> no doubt about it. No doubt. Uh, Chiefs, 30-27. Why? Why? Patrick. He, he's just a different kind of player. <laughs> I don't even think he thinks when he's out there. I got that quarterback from Texas, Patrick Mahomes. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's what's going to happen? Come on, yes, sir. Same frame because I just think they're – Offense, defense, special teams, you know, with Ray Ray McLeod as a returner. Yeah. In, in Super Bowls, man, you don't know who's going to become the star. Well, the 49ers have a few more stars. A lot of opinions. A lot of people like the Chiefs. A couple people like the Niners. Here's what I know. I've gotten the Super Bowl right for seven straight years. I usually have a really strong feeling who's going to win the game. This year, I don't. The line seems kind of weird. I don't know why San Francisco is favored. But everybody likes the Chiefs, and the line seems kind of weird. So give me the Niners. Lay the two. Covering the Super Bowl in Las Vegas, I'm J.P. Finley. Okay, I don't know how much company you got there, J.P. This leads us now to our survey question of the day. Who are you folks out there rooting for in the Super Bowl? The Chiefs, the Niners, or maybe Usher or Taylor Swift? You can join the conversation online and in the NBC Washington app. And looking at the latest numbers that we've got, it looks like more people are going for the Niners now. 41% to 36 for the Chiefs. All right, we'll see who wins. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens were so, so close and yet so far from the Super Bowl this year. But today, Maryland Governor Wes Moore made sure that they have something to cheer about this Sunday. The governor proclaimed Sunday, February 11th, Lamar Jackson Day. The proclamation was in honor of Jackson winning his second NFL MVP award. Jackson is only the 11th quarterback in history to achieve that feat and the youngest one to do so. The Ravens lost to the Kansas City Chiefs in the AFC Championship game last week, you may recall, unfortunately. We'll be right back. Still ahead in the scene, dragon dance parties, brass band parades, a birthday celebration for Frederick Douglass. I'm Tommy McFly. There's also some big sports thing going on, too, I heard. The weekend scene is on the way. All right, the weekend is here and parades, puppies and so much more are on tap at events all across the region. Our Tommy McFly is sharing the biggest and the best celebrations happening in our area in the weekend scene. Parades, parties and puppies, plus a big football game. What more could you want in a weekend? Lunar New Year celebrations are underway all around the DMV. The big parade, of course, in Chinatown Sunday at 2. We even got a little preview in our newsroom of what you can expect. It's happening along 8th Street Northwest. Also check out the Chinese American Museum for family activities, story time and tea. The Postal Museum's Family Festival is in Dragon Spirit. And there's even a lion dance and red envelope giveaway at Montgomery Mall. The Wharf is kicking off Mardi Gras, waterfront party, brass bands, and their parade is on Saturday. Plus, fireworks at sunset. And you know how much we love fireworks. Frederick Douglass' birthday celebration is Saturday, too, at the Ark in Anacostia. Singers, dancers, and performers highlighting African Americans in the arts. And this is very special. For the first time, Duke Ellington School of the Arts is opening up their design vault to the public, selling pieces of arts history. Check out that very special sale on Saturday. Story District is making the days around Valentine's Day a little less lonely for singles and providing laughs for everyone. They're bringing back their Sucker for Love show. Heartfelt stories you can enjoy at the Lincoln Theater on Saturday. It's really a good time. The stories are um, really and truly uh, heartfelt. Some will make you may make you cry, some will make you laugh, some will make you uh, make some other noises as well. It is really just uh, a great time for everybody. And maybe you're not into the 49ers or the Chiefs or Taylor Swift for that matter. Maybe root for Team Rough or Fluff in the Puppy Bowl and at Bark Social in Bethesda and Alexandria. They've got a full party planned. Plus, pups to tackle your heart. Yes, it is an adoptable event at both locations too. I'm Tommy McFly. Have an awesome weekend.
closer to the Summer Olympics, we're getting our first look at the medals the athletes will receive for their achievements in Paris. Olympic officials say each medal will include hexagon-shaped tokens, and they're going to be forged out of scrap metal from the Eiffel Tower. The tokens sit in the center of the gold, silver, and bronze medals. You see them there. The back of the medals feature the Greek goddess of victory, Nike, and there are also images of the Acropolis and the Eiffel Tower. More than 5,000 of these medals have been produced by France's Mint. And a reminder, NBC4 is your home for all of the Olympic action this summer. Our Jumi Olabanji will be in Paris covering it all and keeping tabs on our local athletes. She look for her live report starting in July. Well, that's going to do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Leon Harris. Hope you have a great weekend and enjoy that Super Bowl. We'll see you back here on Monday.